Okay, so my name is Justin and Archie is my son, two and a half years old. The reason why I don't play guitar as much as I used to, uh, if you have noticed in the back, there is a guitar behind me. Uh, and then Jessica is my wife. She's actually from Zimbabwe, from, from Harare, if anyone is dialing in uh, from that neck of the woods. Uh, we live in Cape Town, South Africa, which, which looks like this. So if any of you have been to Cape Town, South Africa, this was last week, about four or five days ago. Uh, I'm a shark scientist. That's what I call myself. I went to university to study ichthyology, so fish, uh, which turned into marine biology. And I finished about 13 years ago with my master's in marine biology. A, a young master's student just finished up heading on out to, to save the world, to save the oceans uh, from, from all the perils that, that the, the ocean and the animals that call it home face. Uh, I started over my career a, an NGO called the Rockhopper Fund, which is a nonprofit organization existing to support the work uh, that I do. Um, and then I also get to work in some pretty interesting places, like um, for some production teams, right? I've helped on, on Apple TV screensavers. Uh, so some of you may have seen the Cape Fur Seals or the Kelp Forest shots. Uh, I've also helped out on, uh, on some Netflix shows like Netflix Our Planet, about four or five years ago now uh, and there's some upcoming netflix shows coming out in in the not too distant future which i'm really excited about and then bbc earth so i've had the privilege of working with some teams in planet earth uh, planet earth 3 is coming out in about a year or so's time uh, i work in the science field the conservation field the ngo field and in blue chip film all of these things help me do what i love which is using science, we can uncover remarkable stories and figure out better and better ways of looking after these animals, leading these mysterious lives out there. My NGO and an entrepreneurial approach to this kind of work helps me uh, do a better job of protecting these animals. And then I get to share their remarkable stories with, with everybody, with you right now. And as you'll see in a, a pretty productive online space. My favorite things on the planet, of course, are sharks. And we went up, myself and a colleague, his name is Dr. Ryan Daly. He actually gave a talk, uh, I think on Share Screen Africa, certainly on LCA um, a little while ago about the findings of the work that, that we've been involved in for, for 13 years. We started this project together following sharks like tiger sharks through, through the oceans and learning what they do. Right? Sharks like bull sharks, like you see here, these uh, curious animals as I slow it down to give us a pretty mesmerizing view of what these remarkable animals look like under the ocean. Now imagine for a moment, very few people have seen footage like this, right? This is, this is completely unique and rare, but the work that we do allows us to get these kinds of insights. Where? Well, it's a little place called Ponta de Oro. This is where the conservation comes in. As we finished our master's degrees, the two of us headed up to Ponta de Ora. It's in Mozambique, and it was a newly declared marine reserve. It looks like this. It's absolutely stunning, right? It's warm and subtropical, home to animals from turtles that nest every year, tiger sharks and bull sharks. We've seen great white sharks, manta rays, sea turtles, whale sharks, and everything in between. And we arrived in this place to explore and learn a thing or two about these stories we'd heard of large fish and big sharks in crystal clear water, right? That's a pretty good place to learn about sharks or at least to interact with sharks because the oceans are clean here. Yeah. The, the visibility is 30 meters, 50 meters on any given day. And that's a pretty good place uh, to dive with very large animals. This was a newly declared marine reserve. It was put in place uh, essentially to try and slow or stop a port development in the area. What that meant is that the kind of cart, the cart kind of came before the horse, right? Uh, we weren't really sure what lived here, why this place was so important. There were inklings of the importance of this place, but let's stop the port development and then figure out what a marine reserve actually means. So we got to discovering. We discovered schools of giant trevally that would blow your mind, the largest uh, on the planet. 
we followed these animals to and from this place and to the other locations on, in Southern Africa that they went to. We followed their friendly predators like tiger sharks, Serea, who we got to tag from the boat, right? Uh, with these tags, we got to see where these animals went, followed them to some pretty remarkable places with satellite tags that look like this. We got to use acoustic tags as well. Acoustic tags that help us follow sharks on a much larger scale and for a much longer time, right? The tag on the left there lasts for nine or 10 years. Gave us insights like this. Where do these sharks go and what do they do with their lives? We also got to learn about marine reserves, right? How these remarkable places work. They fill up and then they spill over. You might notice sanctuary zones, scuba zones, and multiple use zones are how we manage people in these marine reserves. And by following and tagging these animals and learning where they go, we were able to identify the places that were more important, the places that should be sanctuary zones, the places that were perhaps less important, where they should be open to the public. But there was one main challenge, funding, right? Working in the science field, we all know this challenge. It's pervasive and it affects each and every one of us. And after several years of doing this work, I just couldn't make it. I couldn't get the funding, knocking on doors everywhere, everywhere I could, climbing in through windows, through the back door, or the front door. I could not find enough funding to run the project. So disillusioned, I left. I left Ponce de Ora and went to Johannesburg to start a financial news website. <laughs> right? I left sharks. I left diving with sharks in 50 meter visibility, tiger sharks and bull sharks, great whites and everything in between to start a news website with my uncle in Johannesburg. Luckily for me, we, it was a pretty big success. This is the website today. I've, I've left this website many years ago, but we built a news website. We built a, a, a media hub in the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. I started a radio studio. I interviewed, or I interviewed a number of people, but I also filmed and uh, put together interviews of people from Julius Malema to Hugh Masekele and everybody in between, learning as I went along to advertise, right? These, these adverts you see over here, I, I built the infrastructure to, to make these adverts. The Spotify uh, podcast you see over here, I built that. Uh, I, in fact, built this entire website. Uh, the website you see today is perhaps a little more polished than the one that I built, but I learned an incredible number of things working in Johannesburg because I couldn't get this funding to work, right? I couldn't get the funding. After about two years, I decided that there was no ocean in Johannesburg, no matter how hard I looked. Johannesburg is landlocked, right? And so I moved back to Cape Town. I moved back to the ocean and with the skills that I'd learned in a startup news website, which by the way, had a million page views in a month by the time I left, right? A million people joined, the, visited this website in one month. I got to adapt those skills back to the work that I love. Airbnb started offering experiences. And so I moved into the tourism world. Now I've got all this insights, right? I did my master's in marine biology. I've studied and read books about the ocean for the last, well, I'm almost 40 now, but for at least 30 of those years, I studied this remarkable place, that salty place out there. So I had some insights that people might be interested in. I started a business called Rockhopper Tours, which turned into the Rockhopper Fund a nonprofit organization that existed to, to support me and the projects that I had left a few years back. I started taking people around, uh, exploring the peninsula of Cape Town, right? Everybody wants to go to the Cape of Good Hope, Table Mountain, Boulders Beach, Penguin Colony. Now you get to do it with your very own marine biologist as a guide. We started taking amazing photos. I started meeting incredible people and what you might notice is, well, a little number, 260 reviews, but 4.98 stars, right? That's 98% of the people that I met 
absolutely loved going around the Cape Peninsula with a marine biologist. I was absolutely in my element. And if you read some of these reviews, Justin is an amazing guy. His tour was awesome. We were able to visit the busiest sites, feeling very leisurely and connected. The tea at Biffles Beach was lovely. I'd recommend this tour to anyone who's looking for a small, intimate tour on the Cape with an expert, right? All of a sudden, I was an expert in the ocean because most people don't know the things that we know as scientists. As people started booking, I started to earn money. That money went into the nonprofit organization that enabled me to take uh, to go out more, to film more footage like the footage I just filmed, I just shared with you, and to be able to support the science projects and the conservation projects that I'd started 13 years ago. Right? The funding came through, uh, through bookings, through sales, and supported the work that was at the basis, the core of, um, of, of the reason why I did all of this work. I'll share uh, the link here in the group chat if anybody would like to see a little more about that experience. But of course, it went, <laughs> thank you, uh, Matt. It, it, went, it went swimmingly well. It went really, really well. But two years ago, something happened, right? COVID hit. And that meant there was a stop in tourism. Nobody was coming to join us here in Cape Town. So with an entrepreneurial spirit and the lessons I learned by diving into the not so underwater world of Johannesburg and financial news, I was able to start something even bigger. Meet a real life shark scientist. We started doing online experiences where I took all of the videos and the footage, the photos and the GoPro shots, everything in between. And I was able to package them into a presentation like some of the photos and videos you've seen today already and talk about what essentially was my passion, right? protecting sharks, following these sharks, tagging and tracking them, the science around it. And then why we do the science at all. Right? For me, it's not the discovery that excites me, but the actions that come from the discovery. We know where these animals go, where apex predators congregate, and those places are really important places. Those are critical habitats. And from a conservation perspective, if we know the important places in the world's oceans, we can start by protecting those places first. Marine reserves are the remarkable tools that we know that work. And so Ponta de Oro was this perfect location for shark science, shark videos like the ones you've seen here, and then actions that everybody wants to take uh, to protect sharks. Well, I mean, that's a bit of a push, but protect the oceans uh, and, and, and create a healthier planet because we know marine reserves create healthy oceans and a healthy planet, right? The food they give us, uh, the air, the oxygen we breathe, and then healthier oceans suck carbon dioxide, right? From the atmosphere, the more algae that grows, the more food and production that takes place, the more feeding that takes place, turns into essentially marine snow, and that sucks carbon dioxide from the atmosphere into the seabed. Now, if I scroll down to the reviews, Notice there's over a thousand reviews. Again, 4.98, 98% of people who joined in on this experience have rated this experience five stars. Justin was an amazing storyteller, keeping us engaged throughout and sharing interesting insights into the world of sharks. The footage he shared with us was breathtaking, right? This is footage that's just been sitting on a hard drive uh, with no nowhere to go, nothing to be done. And now it's been packaged into a story which is less a lecture and more an interactive documentary, right? I, I promote and encourage questions and comments and interruptions all the way throughout so that every person who joins in, who pays to join in, is entertained and is left feeling like they've got something unique, which as a scientist for all of us, is something really easy to get hold of, right? The, the work that you do, the, the animals that you focus on, the animals that you are interested and passionate about, gives you insights and value that the rest of the world doesn't have, right? Nobody else has the insights that you and I have. 
So as I scroll through these over a thousand reviews collected in the last two years, you can imagine how many people there were paying for this experience. Joining in from uh, last night was a Father's Day event. We had two families who joined in about, uh, as a Father's Day gift for their dads who, who absolutely loved sharks. I get to work uh, with teams like Meta, right, who own Facebook, Google, and Spotify. Uh, some of the biggest companies in the world do team building events where they just want something different. I had a good story, some entertainment, and perhaps a little bit of good news. What you see in the news around you, as I learned so valuably from uh, my time at biznews.com, is that it's always the bad stuff that gets shared, right? No one's talking about the good stuff. No one's talking about marine reserves creating healthy oceans and healing, and, and the marine reserves that we know around the world that have already done this 20 years ago. Right, that feed communities that have nurtured and farmed them rather than extracted and hunted them. Right? We know these solutions exist out there. No one's sharing them. So that gives us an incredible opportunity to talk about the work that we do and to talk about these solutions that excite people. Right? At the end of an hour of talking about sharks and marine reserves, people are excited about the work that we do. I get to share the website, I get to share uh, downloads, my newsletter, things like that to people who are interested in and build a bigger and bigger community, all supporting the work that we do. After two years of um, sharing shark stories and videos and photos, we've now supported, uh, where am I, sorry, we have now supported the Rock Upper Academy, right? We've trained youngsters to be passionate ocean storytellers. Uh, all of these people are working in a marine reserve here in, in South Africa, a remarkable place. And with funds that I've collected by sharing these stories about marine reserves, we've been able to go full circle and support these people, these youngsters who are interested in sharing their stories and their learnings, right? Working with an organization called Cape Nature down here in South Africa. Now, you might ask yourself, is this for me, right? Is this, is this, uh, is there enough interest in, in insects or, or antelope or, or elephants or whatever it might be? And I'd like to just share this, this simple Google search. Are investors investing in sustainability, right? That's probably the worst kind of search term you could possibly see. But what you might notice on the right-hand side here are these kind of graphs, right? And I'm hoping that as we have a scientific background, you might understand what these sort of graphs mean. There is an incredible surgence, resurgence in interest in the environment an interest in creating sustainable products and businesses out there that allow us to live in harmony with the ocean. Right now, there's never been more interest in products and services that create healthy planets, healthy oceans, healthy stories, right? Mine is just a story and uh, people latch onto my story and, and share it with their friends, leave leaving my online experience and, and hopefully here today with a sense of positivity that it's not too big, right? With the solutions we know that work and this amount of money funneling into conservation projects and sustainable uh, changing businesses that are already working, that work really well, changing them to be more sustainable, right? By putting uh, solar panels on their roofs instead of burning coal, uh, by by supporting their families and upskilling and educational programs, right? There's never been a better time to be in the space that we're in, which is the space of conservation. All right, we are almost on half an hour. So I think it's time just to leave you with a few thoughts, a few things that I have used to approach the work that I do. First things first, for me, I always come back to the concept of lifelong learning. I was at a point in my career where I couldn't find funding. I could not get funding. And so I jumped ship, right? 
I urge you, if you are at a point where you're hitting your head against the wall, or you feel like there's nowhere else to go, do something different. For two years, I built a website that put me in the most incredible position now to circle back and do a way more productive job of protecting the ocean. Right? I know so many things about advertising, marketing, the online space, just by doing something a little bit different. Right? If you're an artist, uh, you're a scientist, but you think you're an artist, jump into some artistry. Work at a restaurant and serve people and watch how people respond to the things that you do. Doing something different helps you to break the mold of what you may have been molded into, right? What you may have through your studies, through your career, through your parents, through your upbringing, been molded into. And doing something different allows us to explore other opportunities. Think global, act global, uh, act local. Right? My work is all online in the US. 90% of the people that I talk to work in Silicon Valley. I think global, what are they interested in? What are they looking to do? Well, team building events where they can reconnect with each other, right? Uh, do something a little bit different, take a break from their everyday life and support a good cause. Well, here we are. Here is the experience that I offer them to do that. I get to take that, bring that income in, support my NGO, and act local here with the, the Rock Hopper Academy and the Shark Projects that I have just shared with you. Last but not least, zoom in and out. Think five years, act today. Often we get caught up by what are we going to do next? What is this week holding for us? What do, should I do right now? Whenever I get into that position, I zoom out and I think five years time, what am I going to do? Where am I going to be in five years time? What are the things I need to do to reach that point? And then zoom back in again, zoom back in to the next 10 minutes, the next half an hour, the next morning or afternoon. And the little things that you put in place now stand you in a great step for five years time. Last but not least, books. Now, for the scientists out there, you may think that this is absolutely ridiculous. What are these three books doing here on a scientific talk? Well, I urge you <laughs> to read these three books. One is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. This book has been around for longer than any of us have been around. It is an absolute work of art, and it may sound a bit ridiculous, but it gives you the skills that you need to connect with people. Applying for funding, sharing your story, garnering support, all of these things that we do in our everyday life require us to connect with people. If we do it in the right way, with empathy, with the other person's interests at heart, we will be way more successful in the work we're trying to do. Second, Daniel Pink, To Sell is Human. Half of our time, well, I think his stat was about 40% of our time. Everyone. Every single one of us spend 40% of our lives, of our jobs, selling, right? Convincing someone to do a talk for you next Thursday, uh, convincing someone to fundraise for you, convincing somebody to do it different, right? To sell is human. And Daniel Pink sums these sales pitches, these, uh, these tools and trends and tricks, things that you can use to, one, not be tricked, but also to sell yourself to sell your products, to sell uh, whatever it might be that you're trying to convince people to do. Last but not least, Seth Godin, this is marketing. It's got very little to do with marketing and a whole lot to do with finding your tribe and your community. Who are the people you seek to serve? How do you find them? And how do you get those people to be more interested in the work that you do? There are people out there who are interested in the very animal or place or plant that you are interested in here today, right? Every single one of us has some weird quirk. I studied fish. There are people out there. There are millions of people out there who absolutely love fish too. So how do you find those people and build your tribe, build a community of support that helps you to grow and be more uh, productive, more impactful, and, and uh, more successful into the future? Seth Godin's book, This is Marketing, is all about that. And I urge every single one of you to, um, to, to read these three books, not just once, but, but several times.
Uh, in the group chats, I've written out a short, very short page with links to all of these books. There is a, a website called Masterclass, which has exceptional Daniel Pink um, class on it. It's an exceptional class by Daniel Pink. I think if you click on the link, you get 14 days um, free masterclass if you'd like to try that out. So head on over to that website, to our website, um, for these books and everything else. And, and we will pop the link in the YouTube channel. So in the comments of the YouTube channel as well. So you'll be able to get these books um, uh, and, and all these other things that I'm talking about. Last but not least, we know these marine reserves work. Right? I talk about marine reserves almost every single day. And that is how I feel my conservation, like one little bite, right? One little thing that we know that works to create the healthy oceans. That, that's my goal, right? Each of us has our own, um, own focus, our own area of interest and our own area of expertise. So I urge you to find yours and talk about that uh, as you go forward. Okay, in summary. There's only really one thing that you need in order to succeed in conservation, according to me. I see it in the thousands of reviews that I've received from Airbnb. I see it in the feedback from everybody who uh, joins my experiences, who joins these things <laughs> and uh, comments back to me. It's passion. Almost every single one of the reviews that I've received have mentioned my passion. How, how other people, other teams around the world can use that, can use the enthusiasm that I have to share uh, in their everyday lives. And I wholeheartedly believe that sharing my passion and my enthusiasm for the natural world is what has brought me to where I am right now, which is what I consider, which is what I consider to be a pretty successful place for somebody who studied fish and essentially jumped ship from uh, the science world, but is now circling back in and supporting science, conservation, and research projects all through South Africa and into Mozambique. And in fact, right, all through Africa right now, right? African Israel University too. So as I head on over to the regular screen, thank you everybody for taking time today uh, to hear my story. This is not the only way of doing it, but it's certainly I certainly hope that I have um, shared some, some insights, some tips and tricks, some things that you might be able to use uh, in your career in the future. Because the, the incredible thing that uh, brings us all here today in this online space is our passion and interest with the natural world. And that, I think, is our strongest uh, and, and most, <laughs> most incredible uh, value, right? That's where we can take that value from and create value for other people in the world around us. Um, Justin, we would normally uh, facilitate the Q&A from our side, but you are so comfortable in this space that yeah. I am going to allow you to, to go ahead and do what you do because you do this every day. I see so, so, so Bill's hand is up. Yes, and um, so I, I would just like also um, just to ask her to please introduce herself, just so you have some context of, of her work um, when she asks her question. Maybe you already know her, I don't know, but um, she comes from a marine conservation background as well. Hi, Justin. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm Sibyl Reedmiller. Uh, living in Tanzania for 40 years, but I'm of course in Germany now for two years because of COVID. I started like you 30 years ago and uh, well, I'm, I uh, created a marine park, a private marine park from the same passion you are talking about. And uh, you said very correctly that uh, do, do work, they do work, yeah. So I just wonder uh, if we can a little bit exchange experience about your NGO, have you considered uh, going a step further with your NGO to actually create a marine park, to do it as a privately funded initiative from tourism. I mean, I can share 30 years of experiences and also how we managed uh, COVID. Yes, similar like UK. And uh, well, I mean, just to throw the ball to see how far this is the way you would like to go. And of course, concerning fundraising, uh, we haven't overcome the hump of COVID, of course. Yeah, I don't know whether your NGO is now 100% funded, 
it's very easy to get, get millions and millions of dollars for bankable projects. That's the problem of this big impact uh, and blue economy market, which is out there now, which is a new one. It's all asking for bankable projects. Yeah? And uh, that's something very difficult to develop NGOs like yours or for a uh, not-for-profit park like ours. So that's another thing we have to start. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. <laughs> Yeah, Sibyl, amazing. Okay, and, and congratulations on creating a private marine park. I think, I think uh, again, funded by business, right? That park wasn't funded, well, it might have been funded somewhat through funding, uh, funding grants and things like that, but having a tourism element to it has, is an incredible way to support conservation, right? Showing people, bringing people to these places. Um, and so I think um, it, conservation needs to have those two arms. You need to think perhaps funding, right? People are interested and, and passionate. There are philanthropists around the world, but you need to also bring in, how is this going to be sustainable? If that funding, this is my approach, right? If that funding is no longer available, how does this carry on? And if you focus on, on that side of things, while taking advantage of the funding, you can marry the two and create a really sustainable or, or long-term long -term impact. Um, yeah, marine reserves are my passion. That's what I love to do. And, and at the moment, we are upskilling and supporting existing marine reserves in the hope that the next phase would be to be able to take that information and expand it and roll it out through, through job creation. So the existing reserves can create more jobs, uh, and that is a much better position to be in when motivating for more marine reserves right we've already created all these jobs here let's let's do it in the next phase and the next phase as we expand out um, at this stage the people that i'm talking to are customers people who are doing team building events in silicon valley right they work at spotify's and google's and things like that um, and so those people aren't necessarily philanthropists but as i build that community of support we can start moving into becoming, I guess, a real NGO uh, where, where we have donor journeys and we start bringing um, wealthy individuals, wealthy organizations into that space um, and, and do much bigger things because selling a 300 rand experience or a ticket is certainly not going to create a multitude of marine reserves. We need, we need the much bigger money. Um, that is not my area of expertise, nor is it my passion, the philanthropy side of things. Uh, and so as I grow and move forward, we start identifying people who are interested in joining us in that. Um, so I think one really important comment uh, or, or note just to make on this is that I don't feel like I'm competing with anybody. Most scientists who move into this field are competing for funding, right? Restricted amounts of funding uh, for projects, other scientists are getting that funding. But for us, the work that we do is wholeheartedly collaborative. So we are looking for partners all through the world who work in different fields, in different areas, who have those expertise and those passions to plug into the existing momentum that we've created in our side as we grow and move from strength to strength. So yes, I would love to create more marine reserves. And yes, I would love to pick your brain over 30 years of managing marine reserves um, in, in, in Tanzania, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Don't occupy the space and give more uh, uh, time to others. But uh, most welcome to Chumba Island. Have a look and talk to our manager, which, who is also a marine biologist. We have two marine biologists working uh, in Zanzibar. Amazing. Not ending, not ending. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Okay, I look forward to reaching out. Um, perhaps if you, on that page that I shared a little while ago, is my email address. Um, perhaps if you, uh, maybe just just bum me an oh, just bum me an email. Uh, I'll be able to. Uh, with some links perhaps, and I can learn a little bit more about what you do and see where there's collaborative um, opportunities here, because there are so many, there really are so many. We, we are in demand right now, uh, people working in conservation and uh, we are in such huge demand. So, so yes, let's keep chatting, uh, Sybil. Thank you so much. Uh, Holly, 
And then I'll head on over to the group chats, which I see has got one or two questions. Um, so, Justin, it was a fantastic presentation, absolutely, and I don't actually specifically have questions, but I would like to put two things on the plate for you to discuss the students that we have here, and I see David Jones, what he has just written in the comments box relates to it. So the first thing is, and you can, you can disagree or agree as you see fit, but passion is a very specific thing. To me, passion is you wake up and you go to sleep thinking about this thing that is in your mind that you want to change. Now, not everyone is lucky enough to have a passion or have found their passion. And I think passion is a word that is misused quite horribly across the world. And students are expected to have a passion and run with that passion. Now, the advice that you could give or what is the advice you could give for people who are still exploring where is that passion and how do I bring it about or even do I have to have something I am so obsessed about that it fills my every working hour to be able to make a change and that leads me straight into the second thing because I think you'll interweave them which is what links with Dave Jones is you know, pessimism and optimism. We have a lot of pessimism going on in the world at the moment because of where we're heading. But the thing with pessimism is you can see the results. We can see climates changing. We can see soil deforestation. And what I want you to work in with the students here is optimism is often about the things you don't see. Because you built that marine sanctuary, there are people with jobs. So we're not seeing unemployment. You see, so Pessimism and optimism is a very tricky thing for students to understand if you're not realizing that the optimism, you will have to have it, and then you won't see the results because you don't see the pessimistic things, if that makes sense. And Dave will bring in as well. Over to you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely, all right, 100% agree on that. Um, so, on the passion side of things, I, if you don't have a passion, then I would urge you to do something different until you find it, right? We need passionate people in this world, and you can find your passion. You can find something that's interesting to you. Building a website, a financial news website, was really interesting to me, but because I did that, I was able to circle back and realize that my true passion is not uh, science as such, but taking that science and, and exciting people about it, right? That was my passion. And it was just a tweak from what I originally thought. I went to university to be a scientist, an ichthyologist, and realized, well, you know, the, the, the quest for discovery didn't ignite me as much as the ability to share. So, so by doing something different, it was enlightened. It was shown to me. If you haven't found your passion yet, but you think it might be somewhere there in that bark in the tree where the acacias live or where the cicadas buzz, maybe it's not about discovering what they do or where they go. Maybe it's about taking photos of them. Maybe it's about painting them or, or writing a, 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 a song about those animals. But you'll only know that if you try something different and, and circle back, right? Uh, these days, careers are interchangeable. Right? We don't have one career for our whole lives. We have multiple careers during our, during our life. And as long as we have an approach of lifelong learning, working at a restaurant, working wherever, working as advertising and marketers, we will have more people in those spaces who eventually find that passion or that thing that interests them enough to get out of bed every single morning. So, so, yeah, so, so passion is a, is, a challenge, is a difficult thing. A lot, of, a lot of people haven't found theirs yet, but I wholeheartedly agree, uh, believe that if you do different things, if you try different things all the time, uh, you will eventually found, you'll find what it is that ignites you. The other thing is latch onto somebody else who has something, right? I reach out to people all the time. If I think they're interesting to talk to, I'll send them an email. What's the worst thing that could happen? Right. If I think there's somebody else who has passion, who has interest, send them an email. See if you can meet up for a coffee or a chat. Uh, and you will learn just the things that people say, the way that someone says something. You might learn a little bit about yourself and be able to apply that to your work. Um, pessimism and optimism for me is a choice. 
<laughs> Every day, I see terrible things happening in the world around us. People driving V8 vehicles that are just gas guzzlers spewing out carbon monoxide in the ocean, uh, in, into the atmosphere. Right? I go for a swim in the sea and I see plastic everywhere. Right? It is very easy to be pessimistic with the world around us. Optimism is a choice. And I remind myself every single day that I need to see the optimism in the world around us. I need to see the good things and I need to focus on those good things because if I don't, I'm not gonna be a very happy person to be around, right? So it is an ongoing struggle. It's an ongoing approach to life. And it is, I believe, a choice um, to be optimistic. One super important thing about diving with sharks, and all of you who have dived with sharks will know this, is that you influence sharks by your behavior. If you swim up to a shark, you're big and bold, right? Eyes at that shark, you're swimming straight at it. Caution, caution, caution. What is this thing? It's swimming straight at me. It's looking straight at me. I'm out of here. It's not worth my time. I could lose my eye. I could get injured in the gills. I'll just swim away, right? It's not worth tangling with this animal that's clearly a threat. On the other hand, if you're small and meek, if you swim in the opposite direction, curiosity. Ah, oh, the shark comes a little bit closer. So over the last 13 years of diving with sharks, I've realized that I have a profound influence on sharks. I have a profound influence on every single person that I interact with every single day. And if I choose to be optimistic rather than pessimistic, I can pass that optimism on to somebody else. And I think that that's a really powerful um, understanding about ourselves is that we influence people around us all day, every single day. Does that make sense, Holly? Absolutely. Exactly what I want to put here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, David, um, and then I'll symbol it back to you. Um, David, as a lifelong surfer and sailor, I appreciate the positive and focused attention to our fragile oceans. Right? There's a big job out there, right? There's lots that needs to be done. Pick the one thing that you like to do, right? How do you eat an elephant? Well, perhaps not a good choice here for today, but one bite at a time, right? We each have our own tiny little niche that we can get into. And if we dig into that niche, we dive into that niche and we use those, um, those books that I was talking about earlier, to help us do a better job of it, uh, we can be more impactful in our particular space and we can talk with people like Seville who has created a, a marine park, right? We can talk with each and every one of you here today who can do a better job of conservation. Uh, I'm not a scientist, but rather a counselor who always uses a positive and strength-based approach for, approach for, like you, finding life-changing solutions. Will you please offer an example of one of the solutions you have found through your positive approach? So, so there we are, right? We have a counselor who works in conservation, right? David might have started his career thinking he wants to be a scientist looking at the interaction of cicadas and acacia trees, but realized that counseling others and, and influencing others is, is much better, it's much more his sweet spot. So, so using, uh, using these types of approaches, strength-based approaches and things like that, help David do an incredible job of, of nurturing and encouraging people into the spaces that they should be, into their sweet spots. Um, please offer an example of one of the solutions you have found through your positive approach. Airbnb.com forward slash shark. That is a solution that I know works. I've met thousands of people uh, for an hour at a time, right? We don't get people's attention anymore, but I get an hour of a team from Google's attention talking about sharks, why we study them, how we study them, what's the point of following them through the ocean, and then pitching a marine reserve and giving them a tool like the MPA Atlas. Let me share that with you uh, in the group chat that you can scroll through and find your closest marine reserve and support that marine reserve through this atlas. Or the Global Fishing Watch, which shows us where and when uh, the most targeted fishing is taking place in the ocean. There are so many solutions out there. All we have to do is a simple Google search, like the one I did on, uh, are investors investing in sustainability to find a solution that resonates with us? 
Um, so David, I would love to continue talking about uh, counseling and how we bring in uh, psychology and uh, techniques to, to draw people closer to, to these remarkable animals and, and create uh, links between the natural world and humans where we live with the natural world, not looking at the natural world in this other environment outside of our windows. Um, I'm really excited, David, by your, by your position, by the way. Uh, Vincent, hello, I'm Vincent from Kenya and I hold a bachelor's degree in environmental science. Is, the way I, is there a way I can be part of your team? Yes, everybody's a part of the team. Uh, you're all invited to be a part of our team. Uh, head on over to um, our website. Again, I'll bomb it in the group chat. My email address is at the bottom. Uh, you can reach out to us. Uh, let's start a conversation. Uh, we will most certainly be able to find ways that we can keep talking and keep chatting and, and learn where, where our individual, let's call them passions, uh, because we've kind of tapped onto that work. <laughs> that word might be. Okay, Sybil, uh, back to you. And then over to you, Sharon. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Just to elaborate on Holly's question of the passion, uh, I think... Uh, it's quite clear you started with a passion because you just so much enjoyed diving with the sharks. I mean, that really uh, fed your passion. And uh, mine started with snorkeling in coral reefs. I just couldn't uh, uh, think of anything else but doing this as much as I could. And the problem was then in Tanzania, uh, dynamizing the reefs was quite a common fishing practice. And that led to desperation. What to do about it? And that was the origin of my idea of having a private park funded by tourism. And, but the challenge was now how to make people understand yeah, that blasting coral reefs is not a good idea and that ocean can really be something you experience and you love. You, you, you need to love it and to learn about it. And the education program we started 30 years ago, which now has covered more than 13,000 uh, students and teachers, uh, was a huge learning curve. Also by realizing actually one hindrance is, and I don't know how this, how this is with your uh, folks around you, how many of your folks know how to swim? Yeah, in our part of the world, hardly anybody knows how to swim. So to provide them the experience of snorkeling in a coral reef is scary, scary, because they think uh, they might drown, you know, and uh, uh, there are these very strange creatures which are con uh, considered hostile or, you know, it's been hugely important to go the whole way of introducing swimming lessons, you know, partnering with a local NGO and give uh, folks the chance to experience the ocean and then to start enjoying it and then to really see uh, that corals is a living thing and not just rocks and stones, uh, what they believe. So it's a long journey, but uh, maybe one has to explore what is needed for people to share your experience. It's not a talking and head and, and, and uh, you can't implant this into your brains by talking about it. You have to find an experience uh, they're ready to share with you. And then uh, it's a long process. In our car park, it took uh, many, many years for our park rangers who were fishers yeah, to get infected with this excitement to observe things happening in the reef and not just seeing the fish as something you should catch and eat. <laughs> you know, it's a long way to be uh, converted from a uh, user and consumer of ocean products to somebody who really loves seeing something happening in the reef, some interaction there, and being happy sharing this with guests and being then as a tourist guide rather than a fisher, uh, actually seeing how tourists love seeing what is new to them, coral reefs and fishes interacting with corals and other animals, uh, marine elements, and then being infected by the enthusiasm of the guests and then developing proud about, uh, proud about uh, uh, that this is actually a resource and an incredible asset uh, they have and that it's worth protecting. It's a long journey, yeah, but passion has to be achieved at the end. And I think it's, it's happening, but it's a long process of education, sharing experiences and uh, understanding uh, the way they perceive it. You no, know, I mean, in our part of the world, it's more seen as a food resource, you know, and, uh, and the fish. And uh, why shouldn't you blast the corals to get the fish out quickly because you need to eat, you know? So it's, 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 it's a long journey, but one has to understand 
Is there a question in there? I'm sorry, I didn't, I, I didn't well, quite get a question. I'm just, no, it's, it's basically okay. maybe sharing okay. your experiences in, yeah. in Latin. So 100%, it is other. a long journey. It is, it is a big challenge. Conservation is a huge challenge out there, right? Uh, but the more we talk about how much of a challenge it is, the less time we have in acting, right? 30,000 students you've taken to go dive in the ocean. If 1% of those people were excited, that's 3,000 people that are excited from the local community who can tell their elders, who can tell their friends, their families, 3,000 people. That's a huge number in a very small space. And as you look at a place that's being dynamited and destroyed over 30 years, you can see, right, guys, there's no more fish here. But hey, look over here, you 3,000 people. There, where there's no dynamiting taking place, there are still fish. So we could fish over here like that, like you see the dynamiting, but then we're going to end up like this. Or we could look at these animals, learn about these animals, start farming these animals, use the tools and techniques that we know today work, right? 30 years is a long time of learning. We can apply the learnings to make this marine reserve or this area that is protected much more better understood, much more uh, impactful and much healthier. And hopefully, right, spill back over into the areas that have already been impacted. So that's absolutely incredible. 30 years of hard work has brought you to this point where you are now in an incredibly powerful position to, to transition those community members who are excited, right, when they get into the ocean, terrified, but excited, and they get back onto land, they haven't been eaten. 1% of those people is 3,000 people. That's a huge army of supporters for conservation. And I feel like if I convert just 1% of the people that I talk to on a fairly regular basis, uh, I've done an incredible job. So, so uh, incredible, Sybil, that's a, an, an, amazing, uh, an amazing legacy to be a part of. And uh, I think right now you are in an incredibly powerful position uh, as opposed to 30 years ago when, when you were just starting out and, and learning all of these things. Um, Sharon. Uh, thank you, Justin, for your talk. We really enjoyed it. Um, I'm here with uh, some of our students from Africa Nazarene University, and I can also see one of my colleagues has his hand up. Um, I'm just voicing a question that was sent to me, I think, by mistake, direct message uh, from one of my students. You'll see many Sharon Jones. Um, I'm just the only Sharon Jones here. Most of them joined using my link. So those are ANU students. <laughs> Um, the question is, Justin, what is it that motivated you to focus and pursue this? That's the question that was sent to me um, that you may not see on your chat. And uh, I'll let you answer that before I have any other questions of my own. Thank you. Okay. Um, I love fish. I love the ocean. My dad was a Navy diver who told me all about the ocean and his escapades and adventures out there in the ocean. It planted a seed and it was very easy for me to, when I was deciding what career path I wanted to go into, was fish. I like fish. Fish are my thing. So that was really simple to say, well, where are the universities that offer ichthyology? And Rhodes University in South Africa was one of those. I got to study fish, but I realized that... <laughs> Studying these animals, diving with these animals was what I love, wasn't really my true passion and the way that I was going to create value from my, out of myself, but sharing the stories, um, learning how to tell stories, learning how to be more persuasive and have an impact, right? Taking all the stuff and having an impact with it. I measure religiously everything that I get to do. Who followed me? Where did they follow from? What are they interested in? What are the things that people are asking me? Um, the questions that come through in these kinds of talks. And I use that information to get better, slowly get better at delivering better and better answers that encourage people to act. Right? We can persuade people to buy French wine by playing French music in the shop. Right? We do this all the time. Marketers and salespeople do this all the time. Why don't scientists, why don't conservationists figure out how to pitch something in just the right way so that people are more inclined to act towards conservation? Right? We, <laughs> we will buy more French wine if we are listening to French music in the bottle store, in the liquor shop. Right? 
that's powerful. And so that is really my passion. Sharks and the ocean are my passion, of course, but that little subtle edge is really where I find myself most excited. Um, so, so that's how I got into it. And this is where I've <laughs> come to over 13 years of, of struggling to, to apply for funding grants. And, and I think one of the failings of my studies was that I never approached it with an open mind. I, I approached, I'm going to be a scientist, I'm going to apply for funding grants, and I'm going to carry out research and continue studying that way. I never took that scientist hat off and allowed myself to dream laterally in sales and marketing and products and business and finance and accounting and nonprofits, right? Um, and, uh, and an influence, influencing others around me. As, a, as a organ someone who runs an organization, you have to be really good at, at motivating the people around you to, to, to do work that they might not want to do, work that might be not fill their passions. So learning all of those soft skills um, has, been, has been something that's been really exciting to me. Yeah. So uh, does that make sense, Sharon, how, how I kind of got there? Yeah. Okay. I don't know if there's anything else from you, Sharon. Okay, let's go to David. And then if there is, Sharon, just uh, hit your emoticon hand again. David. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Justin. Uh, yes, my name is David. Allow me not to put on my video because I do not have a very strong internet where I am. No problem. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, I'm actually a colleague to Sharon, Dr. Sharon. Um, we are a team from uh, Kenya, African Australian University. And I must, first of all, um, thank you, Justin, for that quite uh, passionate, informative sharing, and for the great work you're doing in conservation and conservation research, despite the financial challenges that you shared with us, Harriet. And I must commend you, your great work on marine ecosystem, uh, because this is one ecosystem that very little has actually been done. Last week, I was actually watching a documentary in National Geographic, and I came across this uh, species of fish called the uh, Anoplongasta conuta. <laughs> yeah, it, it actually has the size of teeth uh, proportional to its body size. And uh, it's a species I never knew, and I'm an environmentalist. I've studied the environment from uh, undergraduate, my master's and PhD level, and uh, I'd never come across this specific species of fish. And that tells you there is a lot to be done in um, marine ecosystem, Justin, and I really commend you. And I like, like that point you have said, what is critical is one needs to pick an area and uh, develop passion towards it and make a contribution towards the conservation effort. And actually this specific species of fish is actually facing extinction because of human activities that is actually pollution. And I was thinking even as you were speaking that one of the areas perhaps even like our students who are doing natural resource and environmental management conservation can pick is perhaps even creating awareness on how we can control pollution into our marine ecosystem. Uh, uh, Justin. So really mine is not a question, but a comment to thank you for that passionate and very informative presentation, uh, Justin. And I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, getting to listen to more of your presentation and even engaging with you. Thank you very much, Justin. And thank you to I Share Africa, even for bringing me on board. Thank you, Justin. Awesome. <laughs> awesome, David. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a big job out there, and uh, there's no no doubt that uh, the planet and the ocean is in trouble. But um, but if we choose to be optimistic and 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 choose to expand our area of expertise, expand our skill sets, we can be a lot more actful, uh, impactful. 
Um, Jessica, uh, what are some of the marine reserves identified? How are you helping and conserving these reserves? So for us, we work in the Ponta de Ora or Maputo Special Reserve, which it has now become known. That's our, that's our home base. That's where our heart is, the pumping uh, lifeblood of our projects. We worked there for, th well, 13 years now in a few months time, will be 13 years that we've been working there. We've expanded into the Ruburg Marine Reserve, which is in Plettenberg Bay. Uh, very close to, uh, fairly close to Cape Town, about six hours drive up the coastline. And we're expanding some projects here in Cape Town, just proximity to where I live, literally 10 or 15 minutes down here. So these are the marine reserves, but we're, my approach is to, to support marine reserves in a way that you could copy and paste it to somewhere else, right? So if we create a, a monitoring app, how do we create an app that somebody else could use in another marine reserve that's close to their home. Uh, because these marine reserves are all over the place, but they do need some more support and they do need some more help. So, so having a, uh, an approach where, where we essentially test it out in, in a local marine reserve and then are enabled, able to, to copy paste it somewhere else is a really powerful way of creating a much bigger and lasting impact. Um, the marine reserves identified through your experience in the ocean. Um, so yeah, Ponta de Oro or the Maputo Special Reserve, the Ruburg Marine Reserve, uh, and, uh, and then a few reserves here in Cape Town, the Table Mountain National Park. Those are the main ones that we, that we walk, work in here. Uh, Joseph, I'm wondering how you're able to meet local community needs while enthusing a wider audience at the same time. Uh, so for me, it's think global, act local. Um, so the, the, the money that I make through these talks on Airbnb and, and elsewhere, that, that brings in US dollars or pounds or whatever it is into South Africa. So we're bringing money into South Africa and then spending it to upskill and uplift local communities. Uh, one of our main projects, the Rockhopper Academy, is, is looking at local communities at this stage in and around Raburg, so in Plettenberg Bay. And, and uh, local communities of people who are interested in becoming conservationists um, and then giving them the skills that they need. For me, a, an, an important way is tourism. And, and Sybil, your, your, your work has highlighted this too. Uh, tourism, so, so upskilling students to become tour guides. Right now, you can walk along the peninsula and tell somebody, offer them a product. Hey, I'm a tour guide and I work in protecting this marine reserve. Let me take you around for the day. You can pay me uh, whatever it might be um, for my time. Uh, and I'm a registered tour guide. Uh, scuba diving, skippers, tickets, um, firefighting, environmental management, all of these things are skills that we, in, we, we enable youngsters uh, to develop and build. Um, over time, uh, while at the same time connecting them with organizations. So other organizations that are already working in that area or in the greater area, because the network effect of what we're doing right now um, is incredibly powerful. So each and every one of us has our own skill set and our own area of interest and expertise. If we can plug those all in together for the greater good, we can be way more impactful. And as I mentioned earlier, my approach is wholeheartedly collaborative, uh, not competitive. So um, th there's so much work to be done. We, we all can tie in together. So, so I hope that makes sense, uh, Joseph. Uh, I, have, I know what worked for me. And so I'm applying what worked for me in much the same way that Sybil applied what worked uh, for her over the last 30 years to make a bigger impact. And as we meet new people, we're able to adapt and change with an entrepreneurial mindset uh, to be able to create a, a better and bigger impact. Uh, okay, Sharon, back to you. Yes, thank you, Justin. Um, I have two questions. Yes. Um, it's relating to our Kenyan concept. I mean, Kenya perspective here. A lot of our, our wildlife is in, um, in uh, protected areas run by the government and you know, controlled by the government and access to them accordingly. And my first question is, um, what has been your experience in uh, collaborating with governmental organizations to gain access to those resources and also share what you do in, in partnership with them 
because um, I mean, I'm, I'm anticipating in the Kenyan environment, that's something we'll have to consider. And then um, my second question is, um, we have a lot of students here from who are actively working in the conservation field, part of their daily life and so on. That's how they their jobs um, is in the conservation arena and, and so forth. And I wondered if you would be, if you host any kind of workshops and how to help them. I know this in itself is a kind of a workshop, but um, is there any sort of um, ways that you'd be able to give them a few more uh, tips related to where they are, in a, especially in a terrestrial um, point of view as to how they can, they can uh, highlight their work or even um, show, showcase their work to, to others and as a, as a part of their passion and so on. And I know the ones who are here already may have learned something about that. But uh, that's one of the learning, one of the main learning points I want them to take away. So uh, those are my two questions. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so from a Kenyan perspective, I have that is not my area of expertise, and I have very little information or, or understanding of how things work uh, in Kenya. Uh, from my experience, working with government has huge challenges, um, but <laughs> it's what we've got, right? We can only improve. Uh, and if it's terrible or really bad and, the, and it doesn't really work very well, well, we can look elsewhere to see what does work and figure out how to do a better and better job. As I mentioned, uh, that Daniel Pink book mentions that 40% of our time is, is spent on sales, right? We, whether we think we're doing sales or not, we're doing sales. If we are better persuaders and sales people, we might do a better job of working with government. And if we rely on people like, like Sybil, who's had 30 years of experience, they might be able to guide us and coach us into how to pitch things correctly. Another book, another really awesome book that everybody should read is um, Tools for Grassroots Activists. It's a Patagonia, so the company called Patagonia. I'll share it in the group chat now. But these, these things exist, right? These tools, tricks, and techniques exist and have been used successfully all through the world. Why are we as scientists and conservationists not using them, right? Go home and read four of those books, the books that I've just listed right now from cover to cover, read them again, and we will all be in a much stronger position to be able to, um, to work successfully with governments, which, which may not necessarily want conservation as their first or primary objective. So we'll have challenges, whether we're starting a business that sells cell phones, all the way through to a business that sells services like car washes uh, or conservation. But if we focus in on the skills that we need to do a better job of it, rather than how difficult it is, uh, we will be much more successful in five years' time, uh, right? Zoom out and zoom back in again. Read, read those four books that I've mentioned to you today, and I will, um, again, share the website, and I'll add in on that page the tools for grassroots, ra gra grassroots activists. These are the tools that we know work around the world. We just need to apply them to the place that where you live, right? Kenya, Tanzania, wherever you might be dialing in from, you can apply these learnings that other people have gone through, the pain and suffering, um, to, to get to a successful point. So uh, I wholeheartedly believe that taking off your scientist's hat uh, sometimes is an incredibly powerful way um, to put us into a much more powerful position. Um, so, so yeah, partnerships with governments are challenging, but we know how to do it. Other people have done it ahead of us. So we just need to now um, learn from their experiences and apply it to our world. Uh, for students actively working in the conservation field, do we host workshops, tips and tricks terrestrial from a terrestrial point of view? Um, yeah, I mean, we can. Uh, I, I am more than happy to do another sort of follow-up session where we dive into a little bit more um, some of the the tools, the techniques, uh, the things that I've learned. Um, so yeah, absolutely. We please reach out after this. My email address is on that page that you uh, have, is in the group chat, um, and we can put something together. Perhaps uh, some more share screen Africa 
um, events focused a little bit more around around tools, best practices, things like that, that we can all use to be more impactful. We all have the requirements. We all have it within ourselves. Um, that's why we all study conservation and, and science and work in the space. Uh, all we need is a little bit of polishing uh, in the delivery um, and, and perhaps some, a little bit of strategic thinking, right? Where are we trying to go? Who are the people we're trying to influence? And what are the steps that we need to take to get to that point? Uh, Sharon, does that, does that make sense? Does that answer your question? All ah, right, there we go. All right, uh, Sharon, Sharon Jones, I was, I was recently, I was in one of our marine parks and I noticed the pollution caused by the boat smoke. How are you dealing with such in your marine or just highlighting a best management practice? These are all iterative, right? We all, we improve slowly as we go forward. People are not going to change their engines if they can't afford to change their engines or if they don't understand why they need to change their engines. So starting off at the beginning uh, is the best way of <laughs> getting to that point of changing people's engines. Changing your engines, by the way, is the, probably the fastest way that you could start making money because two-stroke engines are wildly, incredibly um, more fuel inefficient than four-stroke engines. So, so perhaps uh, starting a fundraiser to buy four-stroke engines for that one boat, showing uh, that fisherman or that uh, boat skipper how efficient four-stroke engines are, and everybody else is starting to look at this guy going, wow, he's only spending $10 on fuel every week. I'm spending $100 on fuel every week. Those four-strokes are a much better option than my two-strokes, my smoky two-strokes. So, so identifying the problems and identifying ways to, to get around those and using other people's influence, right? 30,000 students over the last 30 years went snorkeling with Sybil. I guarantee that three of 3,000 of those students were really excited about it and would do it again in a heartbeat if they could. Use those people's excitement to influence the rest of the community around them by showing them how marine reserves work because we know that marine reserves do work. We know that reserves work. Uh, so it's not a theory anymore. It's not, uh, it's not. We don't have to try and pull the wool over people's eyes. From, <laughs> from our side, we would like to say a big thank you, sir. Um, Justin, it was a fantastic presentation and it was really a lesson in communication and entrepreneurship. And what makes it more powerful is that we really learned from your personal life story. And um, that's the best way to learn is to learn from modeling. Um, so, you know, yeah, thank you. We will definitely ask you back to this platform. 